I think that's why I do what I do because people don't know about this. People don't know about this world. Well, hello and welcome back. Thank you for tuning in. We are back after our annual summer break and looking forward to some really incredible guests coming up in the next couple of months. This week, as promised, we are talking motocross. Our guest is writer and filmmaker Eileen Metz. Eileen is the first woman in Canada to jump her dirt bike into an airbag, a motocross champion, and is the creator of Diaries of Badass Chicks. She won grant money from the Tell a Story Hive and made the pilot. It is really terrific, so definitely check it out. The link is in our show notes at hearhersports.com. Eileen and I have a great conversation about what she's been thinking about while getting this project made. She started the story, which is somewhat biographical, because of all the inequity she saw in the sport she loves so much. We talk about that sport, we talk about being taken seriously, getting the proper gear and equipment for high-level performance, ageism, learning to ride with a bunch of little kids, and feeling indestructible as a motorbike rider. Eileen is a meditator, so the discussion gets a little bit philosophical. Well, let's get to it. Hi, Eileen, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Hi. We scheduled this call so long ago and I've really been looking forward to talking to you since then. And I want to start out with Diaries of Badass Chicks because the pilot is so, so good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Can you introduce yourself and also introduce the project? Hi, um, my name is Eileen Metz. I am a filmmaker and a motocross racer from Vancouver, originally from Estonia. And the project that I created is called Diaries of Badass Chicks. The, the reason why I created it, the list is so long. Basically, there's nothing like this out there. There is nothing celebrating badass women of motocross or motorsports in general. And we don't really have positive representation of motorcycles in the media. So I'm trying to break the barriers in that sense and also showing women how motorcycles can be exciting for them and that this world is very exciting and badass but there are also a lot of things that we as women have to deal with in terms of inequality and sexism and yeah and I think Media is the way to go because this is the way to get the message to the most people as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why was it important for you to take this on? I mean, I, I heard all your reasons, but, you know, you could have just done your own thing. Well, <laughs> this is kind of my thing. But, well, basically, I moved to Canada to be an actor. I was a director in Estonia. And I was waiting for a role that would fit me, that I would be excited playing and that would showcase everything that I do. But there wasn't any. There wasn't any roles about badass women on motorcycles. And all of the roles, you're the, the best friend or the wife staying at home. And I'm like, this is not who <laughs> women are. <laughs> this is like, why, why do people keep writing women as the sidekick or the sideshow or just an afterthought when there's so many badass women out there? Right. And there were some things that happened to me at, at races and things that I saw. And I saw that women did not really speak up for themselves they just let things happen because this is the status quo and if you speak up I've seen people I've seen women get banned from racing because they spoke up and they just stood for their rights so I'm like I do not race professionally this is not my intention I I do race I love motocross but I don't care if I get banned I'm going to call you people out on things that is not right. And the way to do it is through narrative, through, through film. Right. And that's the thing. I was waiting for someone to write this role for me. And it took me a couple of years to realize that it's me. <laughs> I need to do this. <laughs> right. I'm standing here alone and I need to create this project where there wasn't any before. And the support has been amazing. 
Do you remember the moment where you're like, oh, yeah, it's going to have to be me? Yeah, it was in 2014 because I was talking to a producer friend of mine and she's like, you've been talking about this for years now, like that you want to do something. Just do it already. (laughs) And yeah, she just kind of she kind of got angry at me. And she's like, why aren't you not doing anything? And after I finished the phone call with her, I wrote the outline for three episodes. Oh, that's awesome. Like, right away. Yeah. 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 Well, the pilot is about your character, Alex, getting back into racing. And she places third in the event and doesn't get a trophy, which I think is really funny. And <laughs> um, none of the women get trophies at the event. And one of the funniest scenes for me was that guy coming out of the sort of the registration trailer and holding up this gigantic trophy and some guy off camera says hey really nice trophy and the trophy holder says yeah for fifth place i thought that was so funny and it actually happened Uh, that's sad that's the thing i that that now that i'm thinking of it that was kind of the breaking point for me realizing that i need to do something because i remember my heart breaking at that trailer going to pick up my trophy and finding out that oh no you're a woman you don't get a trophy because you pay the same race fees this sport is expensive and this sport is very dangerous and you get into it hoping that you would be recognized hoping that people see your effort and then you don't even you don't even get that right so yeah it's it's also you're not being taken seriously Yeah. Yeah. This is the biggest thing of not being taken seriously. You're a sideshow. I think it's across the board in motorsports as well. And like male dominated extreme sports, they cut the race times for women. And yeah, they put them at times where it's like before the actual race so that the spectators don't even know to come early, which has actually happened as well. And I don't think it's okay. Right. It's so interesting, too, because a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, and I think that's why I found that guy coming out of the trailer with a fifth place trophy so funny, was because it was really felt familiar. And when I say funny, I mean like sad funny, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. it felt really familiar to the times that I was bike racing. Mm -hmm. And that sport is so traditionally male. And I think it's really hard to break away from that tradition. Are you finding that in motorsports, too? Yes, because, yeah, there have been times where you go to an event or a motorcycle show or even a dealership with your guy friends. And the the people there, working there, they don't really address you. They address your guy friends. Even when you ask a question, they don't really address you because you're just there. You just, you just may be curious and they're like, oh, they're there. But... Um, It's like constantly proving that you're worthy or constantly proving that, no, I can actually do this. But whereas for guys, they don't have to prove anything because they're guys. They obviously can do this. Why can't women have the same level of expectation as well? Do you find this this sort of these same issues in your film career? Uh, Yes, a little bit. It's getting better now, but I think a lot of it is ticking the boxes for for film as well because they're like, oh, we need to have a certain amount of women, but it helps us, but it doesn't help us. You know what I mean? (laughs) Because we don't want to be just a tick in the box. We want to be taken seriously and we want to be at the table because we actually deserve to be at the table because we're good. Right. And also being put into positions where you can actually make decisions. Yes. That Yeah, that is a big thing where actually where you can actually make an impact and make your voice heard and make a change. What has been the impact of Diaries of the Badass Chicks? It's twofold. There's an impact on me because it's like my baby. I created this and I didn't really know where it was going to go because I didn't anticipate the support from all the women. Because for the Kickstarter campaign, women from all over the world sent us videos and messages and photos of them 
and they had our banners and it was just seeing how much this project is needed just fuels me even more because this is something that actually can make a change and can change the face of motocross and put women on the map because I see it as something that crosses, it kind of creates a bridge between film world and motocross world. Because, yes, there are documentaries of pro racers, and there are some even about women, but mostly 90%, 95% is about men. But that audience is quite limited. It's like, it's like Pitch Perfect, about a cappella singing. Nobody really cared about it before it came out, but if you put the human condition and the issues that we deal with in another and an exciting world, you see that, wow, okay, this is something that I could maybe do as well. So bringing it to mainstream and bringing the issues to mainstream, because if it's just contained in that world, nobody really cares. But the issues, the inequality and the female representation, that's universal. And we need to change it, like, every industry at a time. And motocross will not get away with having these practices. Do you sometimes get frustrated? And, you know, like, I'm relating it to me doing this podcast. You know, I feel very similar to you that, you know, like, what I'm doing, introducing a bigger audience to all these incredible women, you know, it feels so important to me. And... I just wonder if it's important to as many people as I would like and why it's not more important. So sometimes it's, it's frustrating. It is. But for me, because in my heart, I feel that it's right. And I feel that if, I, if I'd stop, then there would be nobody doing what I do. So I cannot stop. And I know that it's just about continuing and the messages that I get from women saying that I have inspired them to take up motocross at the age of 35 or 40, this is the proof that I need because we don't do it for the fame or it has to go deeper than that. It has to go, it has to go to the core of things in wanting to make a change and wanting to make the world a better place and wanting for all the small kids, the girls growing up to see that, yes, they can be badass and they can ride their bikes as well as the guys do or even better. So I think if we're doing it for the right reasons, this is, uh, this is all we need. Because there's a lot of people who, who have told me as well, like, why don't you give up already? Or why would I? Right, right. Why would you? Yeah. So where are you at now with the project? And what's the sort of the schedule coming up? So going back to where it started, 2017, we won a grant to film the pilot, which has now kind of become a proof of concept. Because we did the Kickstarter a couple of months back, we didn't get the money, but it was such a blessing in disguise. That's the thing. These things might seem like the end of the world when they're happening, but then you realize that, oh, it's because a bigger door was opening. This pilot now is a proof of concept because I had pitched this series as a 10-minute episodic series for YouTube. But none of the people who are on board for this and all our fans, everybody saw it as a half hour Netflix or Amazon Prime show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's funny because as a woman, yeah, I was like, oh, maybe, yeah, I, maybe I should keep it like smaller. And uh, now the more that I'm kind of growing into my power, I'm realizing that why? No. Like, That's this a is, lesson. Yeah. This is not a small thing. And I have rewritten the pilot as a half hour. And uh, right now I'm, yeah, switching things around with the whole concept to make it bigger. 
because it it's always been bigger. It's just I think my conditioning as a woman, as a female filmmaker, it's just held me back. And now I'm just I'm just breaking those walls down. That's so exciting. Yeah, and it's interesting that a lot of people who pledged to the Kickstarter, they've been writing to me and they're like, but we still want the things that we pledged for, like the perks. So now we're opening up our um, online store for the merchandise, which oh, is wow. going to help. Yeah, which is going to help to create the show. So it's 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 been an exciting a lot of a lot of ups and downs for sure, but our fans and the people supporting us they've really they really kind of bring me back on track, even when I'm doubting myself or wondering like if if I'm gonna get the funding or what's gonna happen their messages just make me realize that no this is going to work and uh i have the support how do you manage those ups and downs in those moments of doubt oh it's it's funny i i did listen to i listened to the first podcast of of the year from you mm-hmm. and she also mentioned meditating and her morning routine and uh, for me, I've been spending a lot of time in nature lately, hiking and meditating. And it's just coming, it's just going back into your inner core and reminding yourself why you do this and why this is important. And when you connect with that, I think um, – if more people connected with that, then they would realize that the universe is actually on our side. That's cool. Yeah, we just need to keep going on our path. Because this Kickstarter made me realize that I was asking for money in the wrong place. My fans are not my financiers. They're my fans. Mm. They can they can help us with the merchandise, but it's still making films and making movies is expensive but this is a show that has an immense sponsor potential because there's logos everywhere vehicle manufacturers bike manufacturers all the gear companies and uh, now i'm going that route cool that's really cool and it's also really interesting i'm always surprised that guests that I have on always come at a perfect time for me too. I just was hiking for two days and was thinking very much similar things about meditating and the universe is on our side. So thank you for Mm -hmm. that. Thank you. The way I've heard you talk about your own story of getting into motocross always sounds very simple the way you tell it. You know, you hated bikes, you adamantly nixed your husband's idea to get a bike and you saw a motocross video called Dream Ride and you totally fell in love and all of a sudden you're riding motocross racing and writing films there has to be more to it there there actually isn't (laughs) that's the thing i saw that video and something something changed in me and i was just like i want to do this i want to try this and that's what i want to do for other women as well because if they see it and something clicks in them and they try it and they find they find a thing that empowers them to be badass. I think this is this is amazing. And I'm so grateful that I saw that video, but I guess it had to come to me. Right. So Do you remember the details of that pivotal moment? Like what was the click? You talked about the click. Like what was it that clicked about that that video? When I watched that video, they were flying through the air and it was, it just seemed so free and so exciting. And, uh, and at that moment I was like, I want to do that too. This is, I want to do that. I want to, I want to, I want to know what it feels like because their faces, they were just so happy and I wanted that happiness. I like how when you were describing initially that click, you certainly are interested in women doing motocross, but 
it doesn't have to be motocross, it sounds like. It's just finding what they're really interested in. Yeah, because not everybody, that's the thing, not everybody would be comfortable on a motorcycle, especially in motocross. But it's just about finding the thing that empowers you to be badass, finding the thing that lights you up and excites you. And I, I've seen and I, I fear that there are a lot of women who keep holding themselves back because there's not enough reassurance for them in the media or in the world. It's getting better, but it's still, it's still limited to younger audience it just needs to change, and we just need to show women that they can do anything. And I love how you, in in Diaries of the Badass, you talk about ageism, that it's not just for these youngsters, that mm-hmm. older women can do it too. I think that's super important as an older person. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not I wouldn't say uh, that, the older person, but um, we, that's the thing, there's, it doesn't matter what your age is. There are women in the pilot episode. There was a woman who was right now. I think she's 61 and she rides. That's awesome. And there was a 50 year old and it's, and they started, they didn't start when they were five years old. They started when they were in their Mm forties and one of them started in their fifties. So yes, the ageism is definitely a thing. Because I started in my 20s, and this is not really common. Um, because this is a world that you get into when you're five years old, when you're fearless. Because there's a lot of fear involved in motocross of hitting the jumps. And when we get older, we just uh, become more cautious. I find that people, men, <laughs> tend to tell women oh you better get an ATV or no no you're too old for that you shouldn't yet yet there's a lot of men doing it in their 50s and 60s why shouldn't women right right well I want to talk about the fear a little bit later once you committed to you know you saw the video you committed to riding how did you learn how to ride and how did you learn about the equipment and you know all the other things that are involved in starting a new sport with such intensity one of the world's only full-size indoor supercross tracks in Estonia. And I lived in Estonia uh, back then. And I booked a lesson at uh, a children's morning. (laughs) 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 Because they didn't have, that's the thing, they didn't have anything for women, really. So I was there with five and six-year-olds. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I didn't care. I was just so excited but I didn't even know where the clutch was. So all the all the kitties, they were going around because their bikes didn't have a clutch. And I was on 100cc, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do here? And uh, yeah, they showed me, and I was riding around on that tiny bike, like surrounded by the small kids, but I fell in love. And then what? And then, uh, I think it's a couple of weeks or a month after when um, we, yeah, I think my husband gave it to me for my birthday, my first bike. Mm -hmm. And did he get one for himself? Nope. (laughs) No, it was for me. That's funny. So, yeah, it was a 125 two-stroke. And I didn't even know what I was doing on it. It was so high for me. And we would go out riding like in random places because in Estonia you can just on a field somewhere. And uh, then I then I wanted to go back to that uh, Supercross track. And I did. I took some lessons there. And I remember one of the organizers of an upcoming race He just saw me in the hallway and he's like, oh my God, you ride. Okay, we're thinking of uh, starting up a women's class for that next race, but we need more women. So if you're in, I'm going to, I'm going to commit to that women's class. I'm like, sure. Yes. And then literally five minutes later, I went on the track with the bike and I whiskey throttled, which means I lost control of the bike and I flew diagonally across the um, track into a hay bale. (laughs) 
And my husband was there and he told me that I should have seen the organizer's face because he just realized, oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> this girl can't ride. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. And when was the race? How much after that? Uh, two weeks. <laughs> Plenty of time to learn how to ride. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, there was a girl who was, I think she was 16 at the time or 15. And I met her at the track. And the night before the race, I remember it was 10 p.m. And she was coaching me how to do a gate drop <laughs> because I had never done that. That's great. So the community, I love it. I just love the community. Well, you mentioned the gate drop. You had to learn how to do the gate drop. What else were some of the things that you remember having to learn? Oh, shifting gears, standing up. That was a big thing. Jumping, uh, clearing jumps, not uh, casing them all the time. Right, right. I, I learned to case them pretty well, which is like you jump on the on the face of the jump that you're supposed to clear, which is like you're, you're just landing on a wall. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So many things I can't even, because right now they, they seem natural right. to me. But back then, everything, even changing gears in general was, yeah, it was like a like foreign language. Was there a breakthrough moment where you thought, oh, finally, I get it? I think it's been gradual because coming back to the fear aspect, because I've had injuries and like coming back from an injury as well, it feels sometimes like you're starting from scratch again because you get those breakthroughs, you clear that jump that you've been fearing and then sometime after something happens and the fear is back. So you need to start from scratch to get over that fear and to be able to clear that jump again. And when you do, you're like, oh, that was easy. That wasn't as bad as I thought. So we make things so much worse in our heads. It's just constantly getting over that fear. Mm -hmm. I know at least in cycling, you know, mountain biking and stuff like that, and I'm assuming it's really similar in motocross, that a lot of times it's actually worse to go slow. Yes. So how do you sort of get over that hump of like, okay, I just have to, you know, like grin and bear it and gut myself through it? Oh, uh, I don't think there's an easy answer to that because it's so much um, about what's going on in your head and you can't really force it because if you're not feeling it, then something will go wrong. You have to... It's like meditation. You just have to go into it and trust and then just pin it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like about riding? Like, what do, you, what do you personally like about riding and what do you get from riding? It's the sense of freedom and the excitement. And it feels almost illegal because it is very dangerous. It's just you and the bike and... If you crash, then you're going to get hurt. But the moments when you clear that jump, the moments when you feel that everything is lining up, you feel like a superwoman. You feel indestructible. You feel that you can do anything. And this has actually helped me with my filmmaking and acting as well. Because I remember conquering my fear and uh, racing at an indoor arena cross series and I placed third one night and the other night I was fifth and I had an acting workshop and a couple auditions later and the fear that I had or the anxiety that I had before going in front of people and doing my bit I was behind that door and I'm like this is nothing like there's no chance that I could die there like there is in motocross. So the stakes have changed. So I just went there to have fun. That's cool. So let's talk about fear. There's got to be just massive amounts of adrenaline, massive amounts of fear. 
how are you managing that? How do, like what what are you, what is your relationship to that? I hate it and I love it. It's kind of I don't think I love the fear, but I love where it pushes me. How it pushes me to break it. Because fear is never a good thing, but it's a necessary thing to get us out of our comfort zone. And I think fear is a lot of lot to deal with our ego, and our ego wants to keep us in our comfort zone and not pushing the boundaries. So when fear is introduced, I feel like this is like okay, I'm I'm just I'm just growing right now. Do you worry? Yes. And there are some things that I do not do, like some jumps that I do not jump. And that's why I do not race like the other girls. They go from race to race and they do it professionally. I started doing races and races, but it becomes your life. And I realized that I want to do it because I love it. My passion is in filmmaking, but I want to meld it with motocross. But if you're doing it professionally, then I think the risks are higher. But then you also you're giving you're giving your everything to the racing. Sure. But in terms of fear, in that sense, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because if you're not doing it professionally, professionally, if you're not doing it every day, then actually the risk of injuries is higher because you're not training your mind or your body that much so you do have to like start over again when you haven't been on a bike for a couple of weeks are you good at knowing where your limit is like you talked about not doing certain jumps and things like that that's the thing i i feel that i put my limit lower than it actually is because i am afraid and I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit that I'm afraid. And it also, you will also see it in a series as well, because I think like a misconception about it is that all the women who are doing it, they're fearless and they don't care. So that might put off some people. They're like, oh, I'm not that. But actually there's a lot of dealing with fear and overcoming it. I think it gets more prevalent the older you get but it's just about training training to training to realize when it's a fear about actual fear when it's warranted and to discern it from the fear uh, of actually pushing your limits which is actually good for you so i think working with a coach helps you because they can see better where you're at and they can see okay like I think you can do this so oh yeah interesting the the reassurance from others actually helps which also circles back to the series because if women and girls see oh they can do it I can do it too Mm. because I've seen it firsthand in freestyle because I started doing freestyle on an airbag and that's where that's where it comes through. I don't think I will do it on a dirt ramp because the risks are much higher, but I love doing it on an airbag because you're like 30 foot in the air, you're doing tricks. And because I was the first woman to jump on the airbag in Canada and I started doing tricks there because you circle, you circle, you circle, you do more jumps, more jumps and then when you get comfortable with it, then you realize, oh, I actually have a little bit of time here, so why don't I do a trick? So I was the first one out, and I think the next session, there were some girls coming out, and they saw me doing a trick, and they started doing it right away too, and I'm like, it took me a day to do that, (laughs) but I didn't have that push seeing other women doing that, because I don't think when we look at men, we're like, oh, yeah, they can do it. Like, I, I'm not even going to try. But if you see another woman or another girl doing something, 
And you're like, oh, wait a minute. She's a girl. She's like me. She's doing it. I can do it too. Since there aren't that many women in motocross, what's your impression of the gear available to women riders? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It is ridiculous. The the amount of disregarding of women is insane and it's just shrink it and pink it right oh totally Um, yep well i'm glad it's not just in cycling (laughs) no and although i like the pink and our logo is pink but it's it's because i like pink but there are so many women who don't like pink and they're not catered to so when i go on the track and i see all those women and they're wearing men's gear that is not really fitting them well and that they're a little bit uncomfortable in, but there's really no choice, especially for a woman's body. And then the manufacturers are like, well, nobody's buying the women's gear. Everybody's buying the men's gear. Yeah, because women are buying the men's gear. It's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I kind of dip my toe in the gear a little bit like I I designed the riding jersey for Diaries of Badass Chicks and even for that when I was ordering it there were no they're like oh yeah we have men's sizes like when you want to like I got it sublimation printed and there we have men's sizes and men's for men's fit I'm like okay but you yeah so I think the revolution has to come from there as well it's not okay that you don't have high-end gear high-end protection for women who are doing sports at a high level or even even as a sunday rider they don't have the protection the protective gear um is the flimsiest and the cheapest possible if it's meant for women That's what gets me is that, you know, it's making all these sports so unpleasant because the equipment isn't right. Yeah. Yeah. For example, the women's pants, they do not fit a proper high end knee brace in them Mm. unless they're super, super loose at the top. It's just men's pants are built a little differently. They have more room in the knee area and men's knees are generally very skinny as well. So it's just, there's, yeah, there's, there's really nothing out there. And I think this has been a topic of conversation for years now and still nothing is happening. Are there any women who are making equipment? Hopefully I will be the one. That would be good. Yeah, because right now I'm thinking that sky is the limit. Like if I'm going to shake up the industry, I'm going to shake it up good. So (laughs) (laughs) I love it. What about bikes? Are you compromising on bikes too? Well, the, I don't even know. Like the bikes are very technical. I find that shorter women have made it work really well for them with the bikes, but the bikes still are built for men. I don't even know what that solution would be because there are smaller bikes with smaller wheels, but that is not like you can't really, that's too much compromise because they're not meant to be ridden at the level where an adult woman is Mm -hmm. in terms of weight and everything and jumping. So yeah, bikes are high. That's, That's kind of the issue, but I don't even know like technically yeah, I, I, I guess they could make them uh, lower, but there are some lowering kits and women are using it. And I'm using a lower seat, which is shaved down to get my toes touching the ground. But yeah, I don't really have much to say about bikes because that is like the next level. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to start with the representation of women and getting them in the right and proper fitting and proper protective gear. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that I found really interesting as I was getting ready to talk to you was that there is, in fact, a huge number of women who ride motorcycles. And, you know, this upcoming Women Riders World Relay proves that. 
Yes. So talk about what that event is. Well, yeah, this has united tens of thousands of women who ride all over the world. And there's a baton that's going around around the world and it reaches Canada in two weeks. And I'm going to be one of the baton guardians and I'm going to take part in a 500 kilometer stretch from Vancouver to Revelstoke. Yeah, it's going around the world and it is uniting women like crazy because in addition to the baton, there are ripple relays all over the world. And we have met up with the women and it's, it's kind of sad that we, we in the Western world are doing it to empower women and to encourage them to pick up motorcycling and to unite us. But in another side of the world, they, because you see those posts and women are like, we're not actually, we're not legally allowed to ride. We would get beaten up if, if we are seen on motorcycles, but we're doing it anyways to empower other women to rise up and stand up for their rights. So it's, wow. it's, yeah, it's another way of empowering women. Yeah, it's a whole nother level. Yeah, it is. So I'm really, really happy and excited to take part in that as well. And that is street biking. I didn't have a street bike until two or three years ago. I didn't have a street bike license. I, I was just doing motocross. So this has kind of opened up the world of other types of motorcycles to me as well. So what's your focus for this next year, next 12 months? Getting the store, merchandise store up and running mm -hmm. um, and uh, finalizing the scripts and getting the sponsors lined up to be able to shoot. So this is the, there's, it's, a, it's a long list. That's a long there's, list. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of things to do. But I feel that I'm, I'm ready now more than ever because I have the support and the Kickstarter kind of kicked, kicked me, Kickstarter kicked me. <laughs> Are you good at, at negotiating with sponsors? I'd like to think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I did think about hiring people to do that for me, but then I'm like, no. Because I'm the person they should talk to and I know the vision and I know the project better than anybody else. And nobody else can have my passionate drive for this besides me. So, yeah. Have you talked to anybody? Do you have any sense of, you know, I mean, we talked about clothing, for example. Have you gotten any sense mm -hmm. of what these people are, you know, like what their interest level is? Um, I have talked to a couple of uh, bike manufacturers. I have talked to, like, I can't name names here sure. right now. But I have put the feelers out, and people are excited about this. But it's I think it's just coming down to actual numbers and actual specifics. So that's definitely going to take some negotiating. Because this is one of a kind. Like, this project is new. And... I do not have a distributor in the sense that I do not have, if I had Netflix, then Netflix would pay for everything, right? Right. Then, then that would be different. But I think the reason why like the universe has pushed me kind of to do it from like a grassroots level is to get the people behind this, to get the women behind this. And I actually have it up on my wall as well. I have like a big printed out sign where it says, become so big that they cannot ignore you. I like it. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So Perfect. this is, this is my intention, becoming so big that they cannot ignore me. They cannot ignore us and that we would get offers for distribution and then we could pick and choose and not compromise on the content because a lot of the times when you do deals beforehand, there's a lot of say what you can say or like who, what you need to write in or, or any of that stuff. You probably know this, like if you get people coming in very, very early, they want to control, right. they want to control, but I do not want the message to get muddled. Yeah. You don't want to dampen down the badassery. Yes. No, I don't want to. <laughs> 
You know, this has really been terrific to talk to you. Thank you so much. And good luck with Diaries of Badass Chicks. How can we support the project? Well, we are on the internet, uh, badasschicks.tv, and on Instagram at badasschicks.tv, and on Facebook at badasschicks.tv, which is Diaries of Badass Chicks. Nice. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. It's been so exciting. Like That's the thing. These things... They, they always kind of remind me why I'm doing this because I have to talk about why I'm doing this. And then it kind of reignites it again because it's, it's been reignited, but it's just like fuel, fuel to the fire. And I love it. I, I love how women all over the world are coming together to support each other. And that's whatever the industry is, I think we all have to support each other. It's so important, super important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I can't wait to follow you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Sure, definitely. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks to Aline Metz for taking the time to talk to us. I'm so excited about her project. Be sure to go to hearhersports.com for the link to watch the pilot of Diaries of Badass Chicks. Subscribe to the Hear Her Sports newsletter for updates on episodes and some inside scoops on what's coming up. I'll be back in two weeks. Bye-bye. Our logo is by Agnes Studio and music by the band Goldmines. We all want to be loved and accepted and taken seriously, whatever the industry we're in. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato and this is Pit Pass F1, a brand new podcast that'll take you closer to the action of the world's most prestigious motorsport. From Monaco to Miami and Australia to Azerbaijan, Pit Pass F1 is on the ground and has you covered. Esteemed F1 journalists Julianne Serasoli and Chris Medland will take you inside the sport every round. They'll keep you up to date with the latest news breaking in Formula One and the most influential views shaping the world of Grand Prix racing. Every Friday, we'll be bringing you a track guide and race preview, and Chris and Drew will be in your feed every morning from Saturday through to Monday to keep you up to date on all the day's action on and off the track. So if you want to be in the know on the latest in Formula One, subscribe wherever you get your favourite podcasts and visit us at evergreenpodcasts.com. Pit Pass F1, a brand new show for Evergreen Podcasts.